Father in heaven, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, put your words in my mouth. Father, I'm naturally dirt, clay, soil, but I've been asked to do a spiritual work. I ask your divine help, dear God. Help me, help me to restrain my opinions and only give to those whom you love. Thus saith the Lord. Thank you, dear God, for this high honor to mingle with your people in this way. Bless them. Bless every nationality represented. Bless the host country of the Australia. Put upon the minds of the leaders, dear God, a desire to make decisions that are righteous because righteousness exalteth a nation. Thank you for freedom of worship in this country. Bless not only those before me, bless their families, bless their studies, provide their needs, and let their lives bring others to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let me put a few words on the board. What's that? All right. What's that? Mm-hmm. And my marker is dying a slow death. Is there? Where? Oh, right under my nose. All right. That's the way life is. Right in front of you, you don't see it. Okay. Ethnic. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you read those words for me, please? Economic, ethnic, social, religious, gender. Now. What's that? Here is where a lot of people go wrong. They study the Bible through an economic lens. And they see the Bible only as a champion of poor against rich. And anything that goes across or away from poor and rich, they have nothing to do with it. There are others who see the Bible through an ethnic lens white against black, whomever against whomever. And with this view, they look in the Bible to answer ethnic questions. Another group views the Bible socially, this class against that class, and they look for answers to the class problems because they view the Bible through a social lens. Then there are those who view the Bible through a religious lens. Which church should dominate? Should be Islam, Hinduism, whatever. It's, they, they take a religious view, which is okay. Then there are those who take a gender view, man against woman. They study the Bible that way, and everything is seen in the light of men versus women. Of course, in this modern world, there seems to be more than two genders. How should we see the Bible? I'm saying this before I get into the godly man. This is not the way to study the Bible. When you do this, you set yourself up for misinterpretation, however scholarly that may be. Here's the context for studying the Bible. What did I write? Did I spell it correctly? Okay, it looks like it. This is the context. This is the prism. This is the paradigm, if you'll have that word, to be used when studying the Word of God. Because this explains all of that. These don't explain this. These provide the proper setting in which to understand the problems that exist at this level, which are levels that are subordinated to this. I said that clumsily. Let me say it again. If you believe in the Bible, sin began 
when a being violated God's word or God's law. And this being has been at war with God for thousands of years, maybe millions, we don't know. It is this that helps us understand why there are conflicts at this level, that, 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 and that. The Bible is not to be studied from an ethnic perspective, even though it helps us understand. It is not to be studied from an economic point of view. It is to be studied from the perspective of an ongoing battle between the two highest powers in the universe, Christ and Satan, and this battle is called the Great Controversy. Having said that, let me erase what I wrote. And, uh, oh, all right. I'm not familiar with this stuck to the board technology. Okay, let me take this off. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, and I'll keep track of the time by using this phone. I don't, I always turn my phones off when I'm in a worship setting, but I don't see a clock. Oh, there's a clock, so I don't need to turn this on. All right. 25 after 7. Genesis 2, let's read verse 7. The Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Let's add to that Genesis 1.26. Turn this off again, because I don't need it. I don't want it to ring while we're in a worship experience. If you don't mind, turn yours off. And if you have a Bible, please use it. Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. The word man includes men and women. That's Genesis 1.26. That is not the case in Genesis 2 verse 7. Let's read that verse again. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. In Genesis 2, 7, we have reference only to Adam, not Eve. Let me say it differently. The creation that occurred in Genesis 2, 7 was the creation of man, a man. Adam, not Eve. Combining that with Genesis 1.26, we may correctly uh, conclude that what happened in Genesis 2.7 was the creation of man in the image of God. Adam was directly made in the image of God, a fulfillment of Genesis 1.26. Go to verse 21 and 22 of Genesis 2. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now in Genesis 2, 21 to 22, we have Eve. All right. Why? Why weren't they made the same time? When God made the animals in verse 24 to 25 of Genesis 1, and God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and the beast of the earth after his kind, and God saw, and, and it was so. Male and female were made the same time when God made animals. When he made man, he made them at separate junctions in the same day. Why was that? God does nothing haphazardly or without purpose and reason. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
We're looking at the godly man. This is not a gender presentation, by the way. It is not. And don't listen through a gender mind or see through a gender lens. Don't do that. You'll do yourself a disservice. And you deserve better than that. 1 Timothy 2, we read verse 11. Have you found that? If you have the King James Version, which is what I have, read with me. What does that say? Let a woman learn in silence with all subjection. Verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to reserve authority over the man. Now, verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Now, we have an, in an indication as to why God f created in the way he did. The man, and then subsequently the woman, and not together. As he did with the animals. The priority or the primacy of Adam in the sense that he was made first, it is one way of God telling Adam and telling Eve and telling us that the man occupies a position in creation, a position of leadership, a position of headship, a position of service. Because divine headship, divine leadership is selfless service. Not tyrannical leadership. Adam was first formed, then Eve. Telling us that God gave to man a position of leadership, stewardship, and service. Now, if you read verse 26, and let them have dominion. So both had dominion, but Adam's position was different from that of Eve's. And this is indicated by the order in which they were made. I'm telling you what the Bible says. This is not my opinion. All right. Adam first, then Eve. Adam, a leader. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 21, 22. We read it before. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, finish the verse for me, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, let's look at the image of God in Eve as we consider a godly man. This is not a gender presentation. This is a study of the Bible. From what part of Eve did God make Adam? No, you didn't, you didn't hear me. From what part of Eve did God make Adam? Hmm? From what part of Adam did God make Eve? The rib. Which means that when God made Adam, follow me closely, Adam received God's image directly from God. Eve received God's image Read my mind and tell me what I'm about to say. Through Adam. But it was the same image. image. God doesn't have two images. Are you with me? No, you're not. You didn't answer. Are you following me? If ever I confuse you, okay. That handsome man is not following me. All right, it's my fault. Let me try again. God made Adam. Placed his image directly in Adam. Are you with me? All right. He made Eve from something out of Adam. How much of Adam was perfect and sinless when God made it? How much of it? All of it. Where was the image of God when God made In Adam. So God takes something from Adam, something from this sinless man, something from this perfect man, material in which the image of God was placed. Are you following me? And from that material, from a man who had God's image, where was God's image? In all of Adam. Out of that, he made Eve, and she received the same image, but through Adam. Now, if Adam had not sinned and Eve had not sinned, 
Cain would have been born how? In Cain would have been born, come on, you said it correctly, in the image of God. But through whom? Adam and Eve. But the same image. Are you with me? Now this puts a tremendous burden on a man. This is not, oh, I'm a man, I'm in charge. Mm -mm. This puts tremendous burden on a man when he becomes conscious that God has chosen him to be the mediator through whom his image was given to the woman. Because if he messes up, people suffer. Let's look at a godly man. He is aware of his place in society as God has arranged it. He's a leader. But we know in God's way of thinking, a leader is a servant. And so Jesus said, or the Bible says of Christ, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. This is godly leadership. And that's how Adam was made. Now, let's look at a godly man again. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. I may not be presenting this the way you expected, but listen nonetheless. Genesis 3, before I get into 3 from verse uh, 6, let's pray again. Father in heaven, as I deal with this delicate subject, you tell me what to say, how to say it, and when. I humble myself, I deny myself. I am just a loudspeaker in your hand. Now speak through me, dear God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Verse five, verse six of Genesis three, read with me. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Let's establish a chronology as we discuss the godly man. Who sinned first? Eve. Sister Eve. Sinned first. Listen to Romans 5, verse 12. Well, you go there. Don't just listen. You go there. We're talking about a godly man. He realizes he has a position of leadership, which is a position of service. Service that requires sacrifice of self, as in the case of Christ. Romans 5, reading verse 12. Read with me. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for not all have sinned. Now let's look at that carefully. Wait a minute. Who sinned first? Who introduced sin into the world? Eve. But when you say Eve introduced sin into the world, now this is the world. And this is Australia. That's New Zealand. Now... When I say Eve introduced sin into the world, she was the first person on earth to sin. This is Eve right here, and this is her sin. Can you see her sin? Right there. It affected her, and that was it. The verse doesn't say, wherefore, as by one woman, sin entered into the world. Sin did not enter the world organically when Eve sinned. It entered her. But when Adam sinned, Sin entered the entire world. It affected the animals. Vegetation began to sprout thorns. We have herbs of the field now. We have painful childbirth. We have sweat of thy brow to make a living. We have the earth that does not produce its bounties. When Adam sinned, the whole earth was affected. That was not the case when Eve sinned. So even though they were both made in the image of God, you can see the difference in responsibility because the world was placed essentially under Adam. When he fell, the whole world fell. When she fell, she alone fell. 
Wherefore, as by one man. I am talking about the godly man being aware of the tremendous responsibility that rests upon his shoulder. Go to Romans 5. Romans 5, read verse 18 for me. Now, nice and clear. What does it say? Therefore, as by the what? The offense of, uh-huh, judgment came upon all men too. Even so, by the righteousness of one, come on, all men to justification of life. Now, verse 19. For as by the disobedience of, who was the disobedient one? Who was that? Adam. What's the offense in verse 18? Adam's sin. What does the Bible call Christ? Keep Adam in mind. Who is Christ? The second Adam, not the second Eve. Adam, Christ is the second or the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and 47. He's the second or the last Adam. Not the second or the last Eve. Because Christ did not come to redeem Eve's fall. He came to redeem Adam's fall. Why? Now, does Eve need a redeemer? Yes. But Eve's sin was just her problem. Adam's sin was the problem of creation. When Christ comes back, go to 2 Peter 3. Let me, the Bible tell you more clearly than I. 2 Peter chapter 3, let's read verse 10 to see how, what I'm trying to say. 2 Peter chapter 3, let's read verse 10. I want you to think as you listen. Think very rigorously. When you study the Bible honestly, God speaks to you. 2 Peter 3, let's read verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which, come on, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall burn with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Now, why, why does God have to do that? Give me one answer. Sin. Sin, therefore, affected not only the earth. It affected that part of, of uh, the heavens associated with the earth. And so the Bible says when Christ comes back, not only the earth, but the heavens will burn. Adam was made to carry heavy responsibilities. Heavy. We've said he was made to be the leader. That's why he was made first. One of the reasons he was made first, he was made to be the leader with Eve at his side, not under his feet. We're talking about the godly man. Adam was to manage creation with a consciousness that if he fell, all creation would fall with him. That is a serious burden to carry. But it ought to make such a person sober and careful. If you fall, all creation falls with you. That's not the case with her. Now, as a leader, I said, it is self-sacrificial service. We're looking at the godly man. And many, many godly men, you have wives and families. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, we'll read from verse 25. No, from verse 22 of Ephesians 5. And again, this is not a gender discussion. It is not a husband-wife discussion. It is a discussion of the godly man. Okay. And the devil wants to cause problems with that. Okay, read with me, wives. Submit yourself unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Keep reading. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Stop. The godly man understands that his headship must be based on the headship of Christ. What did Christ do for the church? He died. 
Did Christ abuse the church? No. Christ gave himself. That's a godly man. Read again. As to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Finish that verse. And he is the savior of the body. Now, let's pause. We have, let me just clear this off for a while. He is the savior of the body. Adam, Christ, the church Eve, or the church, the woman. Now, the husband is head of the wife, even as head of wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Christ is also the savior of the body. The, the body, the church is the body of Christ. Now, how do we apply that to Adam, the godly man? Christ is the savior of the body. Christ cannot be the savior of the body by joining the body in sin. Christ is the savior of the body by trying to get the body out of sin. Let's go to Adam. Genesis 3. Read from verse 6 again. Read, do you have Genesis 3? Reading from verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now stop. Let's add to that what God told Adam in Genesis 3.17. Let's look at Genesis 3.17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now, in verse 6 of chapter 3, the Bible says, She took of the fruit, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. Verse 17 says, God tells Adam, Because you hearken unto the voice of your wife, and joined her in sin, I'm cursing the whole world. Then what is God telling Adam he should not have done? What should he have done? Let me ask that way. Well, okay, all right. No, he wasn't there. Well, it sounds like that, but he wasn't there. He wasn't there. So here she comes with the fruit. What should he have done? We know what he should not have done. He should not have joined her. Because then he ceased to be the savior of the body, he became the destroyer. His duty as a godly man was to save the body. Adam, carrying out his godly duty, should have said, Eve, I love you. But I love God more. Let me talk to God about this. Let me intercede on your behalf. And then we go and confess. Ella White writes, if Satan had repented, God would have restored him. Did you hear what I said? Listen, no, no, no. Before, long before Eve, if Satan, when he rebelled Lucifer, had repented, the only way you repent is if you have sinned. If after Lucifer sinned, he had repented, Christ would have restored him to his position. Well, is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? If he was willing to forgive Satan and restore him, couldn't he do the same for Eve? <laughs> But instead of Adam 
being the savior of the body, which is what a godly man should do for his wife and his family. Adam joined her in sin. Thereby placing his wife above God. Go to Joshua 24, 15. Let's look at a godly man. Joshua 24, verse 15. Ten minutes to eight. Joshua 24. We read verse 15 now. We must read microscopically. Let the words speak to us. Joshua 24. Reading verse 15. When you found it, say amen. All right, read with me. What does it say? And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye will. Now, keep reading. Whether the gods which your fathers served, that were on the other side of the flood, are the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Now, very carefully read the end of that verse. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I want you to look at Joshua's words as we talk about the godly man. Joshua says, as for me and my house. What does my house mean? The walls and the chairs, what does my house mean? Family. The family. <laughs> A family can be just you and your wife. Is that a family? Yes, you don't need children to have a family. So Joshua is saying, as for me and my family. Now, could he, about my house, could he have said, as for my house, we'll serve the Lord. Would that have included him? Yes. Then why does he say, as for me and my house? All right, what's that? What? Okay, headship. What else? But the headship is still built into, as for my house. Why does he say, as for me and my house? All right, first has to be him. What else? Hmm? He has an individual choice, even as a member of a family. So what is Joshua saying? If my house does not serve God, finish my words. I'll serve him. Now that's an individual choice, even in a family setting. Do you know how many individuals cannot make that choice? They go as the family goes, even if the family is wrong. A godly man stands for truth and does not move. If his wife goes off, he does not move, but his heart breaks for her. He does everything he can to reclaim her, reclaim his children, reclaim his grandmother, his father. He does not move off that platform of truth because God comes first to him than everyone else. As for me mm -hmm, and my house, we will serve the Lord. But if my house decides not to serve God, I'm serving God. A godly man puts God first. However much it breaks his heart, he puts God first. Not the family. Hard thing to say in a setting like this. Let me say it again. The godly man puts God first. Let's look at the ultimate godly man, that's Christ. Who is his woman? The church. The church has sinned, violated God's law. Now Christ can try to change God's law to accommodate his woman. Mm -hmm. Christ can appeal to the Father, why don't you lower your standards and make life easy for my woman? No. Woman, you've got to come up to God's law, I'll provide a way. I cannot change my father's standards. I cannot lower his law. You have to come up. I have found a way to bring you up. Savior of the body. The godly man spends a lot of time in prayer while his family is sleeping because he is the savior of the body. 
You remember Job? When his sons and daughters were eating, they'd be eating frequently and drinking and whatever they're doing. What did Job do? Yes, just in case, because Job realizes that's my responsibility as the head of my home. He offers sacrifices just in case, without even knowing if his sons and daughters had sinned. The Bible says, just in case, but adventure they've sinned against God. He offered sacrifices on their behalf. That's the godly man. He has a concern for the salvation of the members of his family, but a concern that does not lead to his destruction. Let's go back to Ephesians 5. Let's take an even more severe look at the godly man. Ephesians 5, reading from verse 22. Are you there? Let's read together. What does it say? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and... Keep reading. Therefore, subject unto Christ in all things, so let the wife be subject unto her husband in all things. Now, read verse 25. Husbands... Love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Come on. And gay. Now, this, we casually read that. Not realizing how tremendously deep this thing is. Go to John 15. John 15, let me take this off. Put something else. John 15, we're looking at the godly man. And the Bible says, husband, love your wives. How does a godly man love his wife or his family? Or the members of the church. Because his influence goes all over. John 15. Let's read verse 12. This is my commandment. Come on. That ye love one another. Now who is love one another? Who is that? The disciples. Christ is giving a long speech before he goes to Gethsemane. You look at 14, it's almost all red letters. 15 red letters. 16, mostly red letters. 17, almost all red letters. 18, he's in Gethsemane. These are the final words of the master. This is my commandment. I'm about to leave you. That ye love one another, but you tell me how. Ah, now, we have human love. Love one another. What's the standard for human love? Well, it's right there. You read it. Read verse 12. This is my commandment. That you love one another. Human love. Go on. What's the standard for human love? Divine love. The standard for human love is divine love. V-I-N-E. But listen, love one another how, how I loved you. But how did Christ love us? Read verse 13. Greater love hath that, than this hath no man, that a man, what, lay down his life for his friends. That's how I loved you. That's how you love one another. Be ready to die for one another. We look at the godly man and his wife. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Go to 1 John chapter 3, read verse 16. 1 John 3, verse 16. This is the same John writing, but a different book. He wrote five books, the Gospel of John, the three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and of course he wrote Revelation. 1 John 3, verse 16, what does it say? Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for his friends. Now stop. Let's look at that. What does hereby perceive we the love of God mean? This is how we can 
understand, not fully, because no human being can fully divine, understand something divine. But here's how we get a grasp of God's love, by studying the fact that he died. Now finish the verse. We ought to what? Lay down our lives, because we have to love one another how? As Christ loved us, John 15, 12. This is the same man. I seem to have lost some of you. Okay, okay. Listen to me carefully. The greatest expression of love is the voluntary giving of life for someone else. Not being killed for someone else, giving your life for someone Those are two different things. Being killed is one thing, giving your life is something else, even though it both leads to death. But hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. This is voluntary giving up. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, go back to John 15. Read verse 12. Read for me. This is my commandment. Stop. Not suggestion. This is my commandment. Keep reading. That ye love one another as I have loved you. Does that cover all ethnic groups? All economic levels? All genders? Uh -huh. Now having said that, let's go to Ephesians 5 again. And verse 25. Have that? Ephesians 5.25. Okay, one person has it. Husbands, love your wives. How? Even as Christ also loved the church. How are the brethren to love one another? As I have loved you. How does the husband love his wife? As Christ loved the church. What's the ultimate proof of that? Giving of your life. Now, is every husband supposed to run out of this place and stand in front of a car? No. But you, <laughs> you realize that my purpose on earth is to give myself continually for the benefit of somebody else. So the godly man, this is, and this is a candle, and this is the flame. Are you with me? In order for this candle to give light, what has to happen? The candle has to what? Consume itself. The godly man consumes himself first for God. And how do you consume yourself for God? By consuming yourself for others. Why do I say that? Go to 1 John chapter 4. Let's read verse 20. The same author, John. He specializes in love. I love that guy, that man, John. First John 4, let's read verse 20. It's okay. It's all right. Go ahead. God bless you for your eagerness. Go ahead. If a man say, I love God, yeah, God uh-huh. And he that is his brother, he is a liar. Keep reading. For he that his brother, whom he have seen, how can he love God? Whom you have not seen. So what God is saying, God has connected love to him through our love for our fellow man. Are you following me? No, you're not. I hate to disagree with you, but you're not following me. It's my fault. Read verse, 14, verse uh, 20 again, my good brother. Read it again. Listen carefully to this good man. 20 of 1 John 4. Listen carefully. Stop. If a man claims to do what? Love. I love. Everybody loves God. I love God. Keep reading. Uh-huh. Pause. Based on what he read, how do we love God? But, uh, yes. <laughs> Finish the verse. Whom you have seen. How do you love God whom you have not seen? You cannot separate love for God from love for fellow man. They go together. We express our love for God by how we treat one another because we can't see God. I can't give God $10 to catch a bus. 
I can't give God some french fries. I can give it to a hungry person on the street. And what does God say? Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you've done it to me. And this is not symbolic. What is it? Literal. Now, Ephesians 5.25. I'm sorry to have you hitchhiking through the Bible, but it's good. Husbands, what's your name? God bless you, Leah. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives. Is that a suggestion? Is that an idea? What is that? A command. Husbands, love your wives. Come on. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, you ask me, you answer this question. Can a man who loves like that hit his wife? Can he slap his wife around? He can't do it. If this were obeyed in the church, there'd be no wife abuse. The happiest women on earth should be the wives of Christian men. Now, am I saying we're perfect? Oh, no, no, I'm not. Don't tell anybody, but I'm not. Husbands, we're talking about the godly man still. This is not a gender discussion. The godly man realizes, I have a heavy responsibility. I'm responsible for the supervision of the universe. Well, uh, creation. If I fall, creation falls. When someone senses that responsibility, what is the person driven to do? And then he does what? He turns to, because he realizes, I cannot do this by myself. I can't do it. People's salvation are somehow, is somehow attached to me. And that's a biblical teaching. The godly man lives with this tremendous sense of responsibility. The salvation of my family is somehow dependent on me. The happiness of my wife is somehow dependent upon me. How another man treats his wife is somehow dependent on me as he watches how I treat mine. The godly man. Go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. I don't like to drink water in religious settings, but uh, may I have a sip? I've been talking since 1 o'clock. Thank you for being kind. The Lord bless you and give you A and 100% on all your exams. What book did I say? What chapter? 53. Read verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Come on, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearer is dumb, finish the verse, so he opened not his mouth. Stop. All right. We're looking at the godly man. Now, there is a condition from which sinners suffer that is worse than cancer. Here's the condition. We drift so far from the truth that we come to the place where we view the truth as error. Or we can no longer recognize truth. Now in our society, a strong man is someone you don't mess with. You understand, don't mess with, that's it. <laughs> someone you don't antagonize, don't get on his wrong side. He plays rugby for some all Australian football rules, that strange game you play. All right. <laughs> That's a strong man. Watch that guy. He'll knock you out with just a look. <laughs> the godly man is someone you push and he walks away. The godly man is someone you slap and he prays for you. Now, we are so far removed from biblical standards when you see a man like that, we call him a sissy. 
Who's the strongest man who ever lived morally? Jesus Christ. Tell me what happened when they spat in his face. You know this man? The only way to live like that is to grab God and never let him go. That's a godly man. He takes abuse like Christ took abuse. Whether from outside the family or within the family. On the job, on the bus. A godly man reflects Christ and how he handles suffering. A godly man is a gentle man. He's gentle. He's a gentle. Eloi said, Christianity makes a man a gentleman. A godly man. What have we said about the godly man tonight? Tell me what you recall that I have said. Just raise your hand. I'll recognize you. Brother Liam, you want to start? Well, a godly man will follow the example of Christ. A god now you've just wrapped up the whole thing. <laughs> a godly man will follow the example of Christ. Mm -hmm. Because Christ was a godly man in his human condition. It's easy to be godly when you're God. <laughs> Did I speak the truth? It's easy for God to be godly. But Jesus took in our fallen nature and was godly. Now he says to us, you can do it through me. Someone else, what have you heard me say? They Mr. Kevin. Say that again. They he did not respond. He did not retaliate. Something else about a godly man. Go back to my earlier remarks. A godly man will stand for truth no matter what losses that brings to him. Mm -hmm. He will stand for truth against the whole world. What else have you heard me say? A godly man has tremendous responsibility, which leads him to do what? Lean on God. So when the family is sleeping, what's he doing? He's in the bathroom praying. And that's the way it should be. It shouldn't be the godly man sleeping and the wife praying, although she can do that. Don't misunderstand me. But the godly man surrounds his home with his prayers, as Job did that for his family. What else have I said about the godly man? He's what? He is self-sacrificial. That's the spirit of Christ, by the way. The self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven, Desire of Ages, page 19, paragraph 2. The law of self-renouncing love is a law of life for earth and heaven. That was the love on Calvary. That's the love we must show. That's the love of a godly man. I sacrifice myself for somebody else. What else have you heard me say about the godly man? The godly man is gentle. He does not retaliate. His strength is in his godliness, not in his muscles and his physicality. His strength is in his godliness. And so when Christ was on the cross and he was abused and he took it, the centurion said, surely, finish it for me. This man, was the son of God, or yes, by the way Christ handled abuse. What else did I say about a godly man? Thank you, my sister. Well, I, know, yeah, I heard you. Thank you. Just thanking uh, our guest sister, <laughs> who is eavesdropping with our permission. Yes, a godly man puts God first. And there are no exceptions for that rule. There is no time when you can put, well, you can put him second, but it's not acceptable to God. A godly man keeps God first. And that's the best thing he can do for the family. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody else? A godly man understands his headship position, which is service, not tyranny, as Christ did. Somebody else. A godly man will be more willing to suffer wrong than to do wrong. Absolutely, I will not add to that. Perfectly right. A godly man will suffer wrong, not do wrong. Ah, uh, he intercedes for sinners. Mm -hmm. That's what Adam should have done as the savior of the body. My brothers who are husbands, fathers, I'll ask you a question as I ask myself. Don't answer me. Are we saviors of the body? Or are the scars on the body the result of our misconduct? And the scars need not be physical. Are we saviors? Are we godly men? What else did I say tonight? Or the Bible said? The standard for human love is, the standard for everything human is divine. It's an amazing concept that God thinks so highly of you that he sets divine standards for you. If God had no regard for you, he'd set human standards. But God thinks so highly of us, he sets divine standards for human beings. It's like, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, education, the Department of Education thinks so highly of a young man in high school, they give him university work to do. One more response. Uh, a godly man should be a good example. Huh? A godly man should be a good example. Oh, yes, a godly man should be a good example. What is the source of power for a godly man? Christ. Oh, Christ, yes. Let's say something else. Christ, yes. The Holy Spirit, okay, say something else. Prayer. Prayer and the Word of God. How else can he know what is right and wrong if he's not in this? The godly man. This is his source of power and his knees in prayer. So while the family's on a picnic and they're jumping around, the children running up and down the stairs playing with the toys and the wife is chatting with her friends, the godly man, whether on his knees or not, in here, he is protecting his family and he never goes off duty. Because the enemy doesn't need you to be off duty for a month. He just needs you off duty for a brief period so he can come in, lay the charge and leave. Then the explosion goes off. My friends, my brothers, ladies, forgive me, my brothers, let us, married or married, men are men. And God's expectation of a man is the same. Let us try to be godly men. Let us be aware of what God expects of us. Let us be aware of what our family should expect of us. Let us be aware of what society should expect of us, regardless of age. And if we have little boys, teach them what a godly man is like. Let the word of God be our source of power. Let our families finding us a refuge from the cares and stripes of this, a refuge. Any questions? Or comments? Contributions. Yes. Oh, that's another story. <laughs> but you're right, but that's another story. <laughs> you're right. He's right. You are right. A godly man should choose a godly woman. Mm -hmm. But to, to recognize a godly woman, uh, uh, to look beyond the mascara and the pretty nails 
and the 12 inch heels, the godly man has to be in this so his eyes are clear so he can see a godly woman. I like that man. He's my friend. Anything else before I close? Gentlemen, God bless your lives. I mean it from my heart. May God bless you. You know, young men in this world, I used to be a young man, long time ago I forgot when that was. <laughs> but because of television and the sports figures and movies and magazines, we have a corrupt view of what an upright man is. But I pray that you would find your model in Jesus Christ. Study his life, and he who studies the life of Christ and seeks by the indwelling power of the Spirit of God to emulate that life cannot help but be a blessing and have an entrance into God's kingdom when he comes. How many of you, my brothers, would like to be in God's kingdom when he comes? Can I see your right hand? One more question, hands down. How many of you will try, how many of us will try to be a godly man? Can I see your hand? Stand up with me, please. Ladies, God bless you. Thanks for coming. We'll say a word of prayer. If I pray, let me ask my brothers, does anyone have any prayer requests? My brothers first. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Okay. God bless you. You know, a lot of people would love to serve God, but they're afraid of what the family says. Yes, my dear brother. Okay. What's your father's name? Wayne. Brother Wayne, he's sick. All right. Somebody else? Any prayer request? While you're standing, go to, go to Luke 1 quickly as I think of your request. Go to Luke 1. Stay standing. Standing is good. Standing has health benefits. No, sitting is regarded as almost as bad as, uh, for your heart as anything else. Smoking. Just sitting all the time. Uh, Luke 1. Let's read verse 13. Let's pray before we read. Father, as we look at this brief section of the word, please continue to be with us and speak to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Read verse 13. Liam, you have it? Uh-huh. 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 Yes. And thy wife Elizabeth. And thou shalt call his name. Okay. Now. An angel appeared to Zacharias and told him, your wife will have a son. You've been praying. We've heard you. She'll have a son. Now, let's go to verse 57 of Luke 1. I'm thinking of what my brother said. He wants to be baptized. His parents will allow him. Now, listen very carefully to what we're reading, because this may apply to many more people than we're willing to make it publicly known. Liam, keep reading verse 57. Full time came. She should be delivered. And she brought forth... Uh-huh. Go on. Uh-huh. And her and her friends came to the Lord had. Mm -hmm. And they all right. You will, all people rejoice. A baby has just been born. Everyone rejoices. They come and bring gifts. Okay. So it's a happy occasion. Read verse 59. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Eighth day. Uh-huh. The circumcised the child. Mm -hmm. And they called Zacharias, after his name. Thank you. Pause right there. They called him, or they wanted to call him Zacharias. But what did the angel tell John, uh, tell the father in verse 13? Call him John. Look at verse 59 again. What does it say? Verse, 50, uh, verse 58 and 59. And her neighbors. Uh huh. Uh huh. Showed great mercy on her, and he came to rejoice with her. Now, those most influential in our lives are relatives and friends. We care what relatives think. We care what friends think. Her relatives and her neighbors, they came 
to rejoice with her. Now, read verse 59. Uh huh. Now, okay, they've come eight days later. They have all come for the circumcision, the relatives and the friends, those with great influence on us. To so circumcise him. And what name did they suggest? Zacharias. For a very good reason, call him after his father. Read verse 60. And his mother answered and said, What? Not so. Come on. Now, to whom is she saying, Not so? To her friends. Now, this is one woman up against all her relatives and all her friends. What is she standing for? God and God's word. God said, John, all her friends, all her relatives said, Zacharias. She said, no. Mm -mm. Now, it's hard to say no to your family. It's hard to say no to your friends. But when God speaks, we must risk being ostracized by family and friends to stand for God. She said, no, his name is John. Read verse 61. They said unto her, there's none of our kindred. Let's call by this name. In other words, you are going against what? Tradition. <laughs> we don't call our sons John. In all my travels, sad to say, I find Christians more committed to tradition than to truth. Mm -hmm. It's my culture, even though it's not in the Bible. They are more committed to culture than to Christ. It's my culture. So they use that argument against Elizabeth. There is none of thy kindred that is called. What are you doing? Who are you to go against tradition? Now, my brother, you're in a difficult position. God has convicted you to get baptized. Your family says no. You have a choice to make. Now, is it easy? No. Do you know what choice you should make? Yes. I was in Uganda speaking a few years ago, and a 16-year-old girl came to me. She was a Muslim. She said, Pastor, I have learned things I never knew. Thank you. I have made a decision to be baptized, be a Christian, Adventist. She said, I don't care what my family says. I'm getting baptized. I didn't know what to say. I was so taken aback by this courage, 16 years old. You know, it's one thing to go against a Christian family. It's another thing to go against a Muslim family. <laughs> On that same, a couple of years later, to the same country of Uganda, I did a preaching series. This young lady decided to be baptized. Her family said to her, if you get baptized, we will cut you out of the will. We will no longer pay your tuition. We'll cut you off. Now, people see education as their salvation. This is my job. This is my salary. Then I can buy a house, get a wife, a car, and 2.5 children. That's how people think. She told them, Mom, Dad, cut me off. Disown me. But I have to be baptized. She got baptized. They cut her off. And then they watched her. A year later, they called her. When they saw she would not buckle, and she suffered the abuse and the neglect, they said they restored everything to her. They realized nothing they did could change her mind. She's still faithful in the church today. God may be calling you to save your family. Again, it's not easy, but ask God for strength to do what's right. He may be calling you to save your family. Now, final verse, then I pray and let you sit down or let you go. John 7, verse 5. Liam, read that for us. John 7, verse 5. Now, you will find this very amazing or surprising, not amazing, surprising, in the life of Christ. Here's what the Bible says. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> The family of Jesus 
at some point in his life did not believe in him. Go to Luke. I said the last verse, I lied. Okay, go to Luke chapter 2. <laughs> Luke 2. That's when they found Jesus in the temple. I mean, you're all young. You can stand a little bit. You are young. All of you are young. Accept that by faith. Luke chapter 2. Let's go to verse 48. They found him in the temple. Listen to his mother. Verse 48. And, and when I saw him, uh -huh. they were amazed. Mm -hmm. And his mother said unto him, Listen to the mother now. Son, uh huh. Why hast thou thus dealt with us? Stop. What is she saying? What are you doing to us? <laughs> Your family will say to you, What are you doing to us by being baptized? You embarrass. We are all Buddhists. Families use that argument and they're so successful. What are you doing to us? You're embarrassing us before the, the village. Thy father and I have sought this sorrowing. Verse 49. Listen carefully. 49? Mm -hmm. And he said unto them, mm -hmm. How is it that ye sought? Yes. Wish ye not mm -hmm. that I must be about my father? Don't you want me to do my father's business first above everything else? Now listen to verse 50. And they understood not. Come on. The saying, they didn't understand. <laughs> Listen to me. The mother of Jesus, handpicked by God to be mother to the Savior, did not understand Jesus. His brothers, John 7, 5, didn't believe in him. Christ understands what it means to be the only person in the family that serves God fully. And you're in that position. Jesus understands that. So when you talk to God, you say, Father, my family's against me. He says, my son, I know, because Jesus had the same experience. You pray, ask God for strength. Anyone else in that position, I'll pray for you, but make up your mind to do what's right. Now let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this night. We thank you for the beauty of your word, the power of your word. Dear God, I ask you to bless my brothers who are present in their hearts is a desire to do what is right in your sight. Many of us are husbands, many of us are fathers. Please let us focus our minds on the godly man. And the ideal godly man is Jesus Christ. Let us emulate his life. Let us be aware of the tremendous burden of leadership, which is self-sacrificing service, dear God. And let our lives as godly men bring the sunshine of joy to our wives, our children, our communities, our churches. Let our lives hasten the coming of Christ. Bless my young brother who wants to be baptized, but he's concerned about what the family says. Bless my other brother whose father's not well. Place your healing hand on him. And any other request not spoken, be merciful, I pray to God. As we leave, let angels escort us safely. Watch over us as we sleep. Bring us back tomorrow to hear your word again. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen. And amen. God bless you. Please travel safely. And we'll see you hopefully.